Well, I'd like you to turn once again, please, in your Bibles to Zechariah and chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 18. And then we will read all the way through to chapter 2, verse 5. We may get further, we're not sure, but at least for now, that's the reading that we will begin with. So, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 says this, Then lifted I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof, And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this evening. Now, just in terms of reminding ourselves of what we've seen so far, we saw in our previous session the angel of the Lord. We we understood this to be a, a Christophany, an Old Testament manifestation of the eternal Son of God appearing on behalf of his people. And there were several purposes for his appearance. One, to assure uh, the nation that he was with them again. He had been against them, but now he was with them. To meet with Israel in their lowly condition. Remember, at the bottom of this valley, uh, in the the Valley of Myrtles, uh, to show that he was with them. And also that they were to, to encourage them about rebuilding the temple and that the Lord would certainly be with them in their task. And he also told us that the heathen were at rest. He and the, the three other angels that had gone to and fro throughout the whole earth had come back with a report that the Gentile world was at peace. And the idea of that is that the conditions were ideal for the time to rebuild Jerusalem. Because usually, if the Gentiles were in ferment and at war with each other, invariably, the land of Israel was part of the territory where a lot of these battles were fought. Uh, It's so central, in a sense, the center of the world. Uh, Continents meet there. Uh, So Europe, Africa, and Asia all meet there. So there's a sense in which it, it is the battleground of the world. So it's good in a sense that there was peace. So it meant the conditions were just right for the rebuilding of the land and the temple particularly. And so now we see this further vision. Remember we said he had eight visions in one night. The first one was the the four horsemen and their riders. The second one, again, we're, we're looking at the number four. I lifted up mine eyes, verse 18, and behold and saw four horns. So we have to think a little bit about what does this symbolize? What is the the idea conveyed to us in the idea of horns? And I want to suggest to you, and then we'll try and prove it from scripture, that it really represents the Gentile powers that have been opposing Israel, that have scattered Israel, that have been involved in bringing 
decimation to the land of Israel. And so we want to look at this idea of the word horn and show from Scripture that it's a symbol of power, dominion, and glory. Often in, in connection with fierceness as well, in terms of military conflict. And so we want to just look at some references. So let's look at the book of Daniel to begin with, as we try to understand uh, the symbolism behind the idea of four horns. So Daniel 8 would be a good place to begin. Uh, and uh, we'll see in Daniel 8 uh, a, a glorious picture of what we're trying to illustrate. So uh, Daniel 8 verse 5, As I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Look at verse 9. And out of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. And so we get the idea, again, that uh, we're gonna, if we had time to develop Daniel 8, we would see that, that that notable horn was speaking of Alexander the Great, the Greeks, and their speedy uh, conflict uh, against the, uh, the ram that had two horns in verse 6. Uh, it says, he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, ran into him in the fury of his power. And so the idea is that these two creatures are butting heads, we would say. There's a battle going on. And of course, Alexander the Great was able to destroy the Medo-Persian army at that time. So again, it would speak of a power, of dominion glory, military might, all of those things would be conveyed in that idea. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Just as we consider this thought, Daniel 7 and verses 7 through 12. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So I think we can get the idea that th these horns seem to speak of powerful uh, opponents of, of God, of God's people, uh, powerful creatures, uh, military might, all of this kind of thing is symbolized. Now, sometimes it's used in a good sense. So let's look at an example of where it's used in a very positive way. Psalm 18. Psalm 18, and verse 2. Well, let's read from verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. So here, it's used of the Lord in a very, very positive way. Uh, his great power uh, is in view here. Now, here's an interesting thing that we, we, we saw mentioned in Daniel 7, about 10 horns. And we're going to think a little bit about biblical numerology this evening. I'd like you to go to the book of Revelation for a second in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. If we think of Horn speaking of power, dominion, might, all of these things, it says in uh, Revelation 5 verse 6, I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. So if you are looking for the ultimate power, the ultimate dominion, uh, you will find it in that lamb as it had been freshly slain. 
he will conquer every other horn that dares to raise its head in contest against him, right? Because seven is the, the number of fullness, completeness, uh, complete, full power authority is found in that lamb that has seven horns. Now, again, back in Revelation, we want to just look at these horns again because they're mentioned there quite frequently. Revelation 12, verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. Now, ten horns. I want you to notice that. We've already seen that in Daniel 7. Let's look at chapter 13 and verse uh, 1. Revelation 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And so we could go, trace that all the way through the book of Revelation, that whenever uh, that person is revealed, always ten horns. Now, again, biblical numerology, if seven is the number of completeness and uh, fullness, so Christ is the ultimate power, the ultimate authority, ten is always the number of failure. To give you an example, there were 10 spies. Were they heroes or villains? Remember, they were the bad guys, right? They failed. 10 tribes versus the two tribes. Which ones are the good guys? Which ones are the bad guys? 10, human failure. Uh, human rebellion, human failure. Uh, 10 commandments. How's, how are we done with 10 commandments? Uh, not very well, right? So 10 always is associated with, with human failure or failure. And so even this powerful being that's revealed in the book of Revelation that has 10 horns is destined to failure. Whereas the lamb with seven horns is going to have complete ultimate authority and power vested in him. And he will defeat any other that would dare exalt themselves against him. And so I think we can get the idea that these horns in Scripture always a symbol of power, dominion, glory. And we can see that in the animal kingdom, the chief means of attack of many creatures that have horns is their horns. And the bigger the horns, right, the more kind of fearsome they are. And so that's the idea that's being con conveyed. And it's very important for us to see this. So when he talks about these four horns, He's thinking of powers that have sought to scatter the nation of Israel. So let's go back again to Zechariah, having done that little bit of research into how this phrase horns is used in the word of God. And so back again in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns, and I, I said to the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So they've been, they've been involved in antagonism towards the land of Israel, uh, the people of Judah, and Jerusalem, and they've been involved in scattering them. So then we're left with a question, well, is it referring to specific nations here? Are there nations that, that fit this description of being powers uh, that have used their might to scatter uh, the land of, of Israel, Judah, Jerusalem? And let me give you the, the views that people have, have regarding this. And I'm going to give you two views that have been presented. And I'm just going to give you to them. Uh, and then I want to think about an alternative position that, that I'm going to present to you that takes into account biblical numerology again. Okay. So let's just think uh, uh, first view is again, goes back to Daniel and in Daniel chapter two and chapter seven, you have four world empires that are revealed in Daniel 2 and chapter 7. 
right? So you've got Babylon, you're the head of gold, chapter two, then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, and then finally you have the Roman Empire. And some have suggested, well, these four carpenters are uh, those four nations, uh, sorry, these four horns are those four nations that are mentioned there. Now, let me give you some difficulty with that position. One of the difficulties that I have with that position is in verse 19 of chapter 1, he says, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Well, Babylon did not scatter Israel. If we think of Israel as the 10 tribes, that was Assyria, wasn't it? So if you, if you think of it that way, then you end up with five horns. You get, if you're looking at Daniel uh, chapter 2 and chapter 7, and you have to add to that Assyria, uh, because they were involved in the destruction of the northern kingdom. And so that would give me a little bit of a problem with that. An alternative that is presented, and I'm just giving you this as the other view, is that these uh, nations are Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and Medo-Persia. Again, I have a difficulty with that view. Not that I'm trying to be an awkward person, uh, but you have to weigh these things up. And as far as I'm aware, Egypt didn't scatter the land of Israel or Judah. Yes, they, they had them in captivity, but they actually went into Egypt as a family and they came out as a nation. And so I can't accept Egypt as part of that, that little group. So we've got a bit of a difficulty. I'm not going to tell you what, what I think is the correct view yet, because I want to think a little bit about the carpenters, because again, as we go back to chapter one of Zechariah, it talks about these nations. And then he says in verse 20, he says, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So here come these carpenters, and they've got tools with them to basically dehorn these powers that have scattered Israel. And again, those that hold that the view is the four nations that are mentioned, uh, for instance, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, they will say, well, actually, uh, Babylon, they defeated Assyria. Uh, Medo-Persian Empire, they defeated, uh, they dehorned, if you like, Babylon. Uh, Greece dehorned the Medo-Persian Empire, and then Rome dehorned Greece. So they would say, these are the carpenters, these are the... Now, again, uh, that may well be, but I'm just going to present a different view in a moment. But before I do that, I want to just look at uh, Psalm 75 just for a second. Psalm 75, and then I'll get into what I think is a more satisfying view. Psalm 75 and verse 5. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. In other words, in pride, don't dare exalt yourself. And here's the reason. Look at verse 10. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And so God is saying, whoever the wicked are, I'm, I'm going to basically dehorn them. I'm going to destroy them. And so that takes me to a view that I think is more acceptable in that looking at biblical numerology, the number four ha is the universal number. So for instance, the four winds of heaven, okay? North, south, east, west, right? The four cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. And so four in the Bible, it has that idea of universal. And so could it simply be this, that what he's saying is that the Lord will destroy any nation, 
that seeks to scatter or destroy the nation of Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, right? No, don't mess with them because you have to mess with me because I will ultimately destroy them. And it's true that many nations have been involved in seeking through the centuries to scatter and destroy the nation of Israel and Judah. We just have to look at Psalm 83 as an example. Let me look at Psalm 83 and just see the attitude of the nations. In Psalm 83 and verse 4, Psalm 83, verse 4, they have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And, and there are so many that have sought to do that, to destroy, to defeat uh, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And the answer is that God will always ultimately deal with those nations that dare to mess with his people, Israel. And I think when we get to the end times, the ultimate carpenter is coming to dehorn the nations. The carpenter of Nazareth in Revelation 19, 11 through 21, is coming to the armies that are gathered together finally, this universal hostility to the land of Israel, to destroy Israel, and he is going to come from heaven, and he is going to dehorn the lot of them. And so maybe the idea is, is this concept of universal. God is universally going to deal with any and every nation that dares to exalt itself and scatter his people the nation of Israel. And, and he does warn, book of Ezekiel, he warns anybody that messes with his land, that would dare to, to scatter his people, to divide up the land even, uh, he warns them. And so uh, perhaps uh, that's a, a more satisfying explanation, at least in my mind. And uh, again, think of the book of Joel, chapter three, verse two. He says, I will also gather all nations, bring them down, into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land. Now, who's he going to deal? I'll gather all nations, right? Universally, gather all nations, bring them into the valley of Jehoshaphat, plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. So God is going to deal with these horns that dare to scatter the nation of Israel. He is going to deal with them. Now, as we move into chapter two, and, and again, maybe we'll just read at the end of verse 21. He says, um, these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So again, those that have sought to do that, God is going to ultimately dehorn them. Now, chapter two. Notice uh, verse five verses that we read. It really deals with the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. He's got a measuring line and he's going to measure the dimensions with a thought like a surveyor you know you'll see if there's going to be new construction you'll see a surveyor out there with his equipment and he's measuring out the land getting ready to rebuild it this land had been devastated by the babylonians uh, it's a ruin it's a war zone and he is going to show that the land is going to be basically the city is going to be rebuilt god's plan is to enlarge and protect Jerusalem. And so the city is in view in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2. And then from verse 6 through 13, he's going to deal with the people very specifically. And so we're going to see the city first and then the people. And so the thought is very simple in this chapter. God's plan is to enlarge and protect Jerusalem. 
and, and as the vision is given, Jerusalem is currently in a day of small things. Remember, she's been defeated. She's in ruins. And so in this vision, uh, what Zechariah is talking about is the fact that this city is going to be rebuilt. And actually, it, it's going to be so established uh, and so filled with people that verse 4 would tell us, he said to him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. It was, it's going to be like a sprawling with people, right? Spreading out beyond boundaries, without walls. Just going to be a, a land uh, highly populated with people. And so that's the vision that's in view. Now, we've got to think about this because as we look at this vision, like much of prophecy, there's an immediate fulfillment in that God is getting ready to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. And so that's what's in view here. But there's, there's a, a longer term view because he envisages a day that Jerusalem will be inhabited as towns without walls. But in the short term, you're going to have the rebuilding of the temple. And then what comes next after the rebuilding of the temple? What does Nehemiah come to do? He's going to build the walls, right? There was, he's going to defend it uh, because a city without walls is easily invaded again. And so he's concerned, and that's Nehemiah's burden. Just reading Nehemiah in my devotions right now. He's concerned that the walls are in ruins, right? He wants to build it. And, and yet God foresees a time where it's going to be a city without walls. Why is it going to be a city without walls? Well, part of the reason is, verse 5, For I, saith the Lord, will be to her a wall of fire, round about her <laughs> so obviously there's a near fulfillment of this it's time to rebuild the temple and yes god is going to be with nehemiah building the walls but there's a longer view in view here and all we're going to see this all the way through zechariah there's a short term which is the immediate encouragement of them to rebuild the temple but there's a long-term look as well to a day coming when this city will be rebuilt and it won't need any walls to defend it because the lord will indeed be a fire a wall of fire round about them and he will be the glory in the midst of them so as we look at this section there's some questions we need to ask ourselves first of all who is the surveyor because he sees a man with a measuring line who's going to do the the, the laying out of the land. Who's the interpreting angel? And then there's another angel. There's two angels in view as well. And then there's this young man. Now we've already, I think, established who the young man is. It's Zechariah, our prophet, who was a youth, a young man, as he began his prophetic ministry. So let's uh, jump into chapter 2. And notice how it begins. And it begins in exactly the same way that our reading began in verse 18. Notice 118. Then lifted I up mine eyes. Chapter 2, verse 1. I lifted up mine eyes again. And so it begins with the prophet lifting up his eyes. Now, this is going to be pretty consistent throughout this prophecy for instance I'm just going to show you chapter 4 verse 2 he said to me what seest thou and i said i have looked and behold a lampstand all of gold so again he's 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 looking he's paying attention um, chapter uh, 5 verse 1 i turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll verse 9 then lifted, up my, lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women. And then uh, chapter 6, verse 1, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked. 
So I want to just kind of pause a moment and talk about this upward look. I lifted up mine eyes and looked. Because the word of God encourages us ourselves to be those that keep looking up, lifting up our eyes and looking. And I want to just look at some of the biblical examples of that. We're going to just do this comparing scripture with scripture again, because I think it's very profitable to do this. And certainly when we see a phrase like this, Psalm 5, to begin with, Psalm 5 and verse 3, it says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. What a great way to start the day when we first begin our morning is to, to speak to God in prayer and look up, get our eyes away from what's going on around us and get our eyes on him. And so the upward look in prayer, Luke's gospel, chapter 21, Luke 21, the words of the Lord Jesus, the instructions of the Savior to you and I as we see things in our day and to a generation yet to come, as they witness things in their day, Luke 21 and verse 18, uh, verse 28. Luke 21 verse 28. When these things begin to come to pass, and he's talking about men's hearts failing them for fear, uh, talking about perplexity, uh, talking about powers of heaven being shaken, so on and so forth. He says, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And if we have an upward look in prayer, as we see our world hurtling towards the climax of the ages, the instructions to us is very simple, right? Look up. Your redemption is drawing near. The Lord's coming. It won't be long. Look at Isaiah now and chapter 51. Just this beautiful idea of looking up. Isaiah 51. And verse 6. Isaiah 51 verse 6. It says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So, what is he telling us there? He said, what we need to be focused on as we look up, is eternal things. Because temporal things, the things of this world, ultimately are going to be burned up. And sadly, many of a, ch a child of God has got his eyes on temporal things and got his eyes off the eternal things. And so he says, look up, make sure you're looking upon things that are lasting and eternal. Don't be so fixated with the temporary and with the now. And then, and I'm sure some of you are already thinking ahead to this one. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 4. Because if we're thinking about eternal things, one thing we know is that people are going to last forever. John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white and ready to harvest. And so we might say that there's great value for you and I to look up. Now, are there times when we can't look up? Look at Psalm 40. Psalm 40. And Psalm 40 and verse 12, he says, For innumerable evils have come past me about, mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so I'm not able to look up. 
They have more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. And one time when it's hard for us to look up is when we have given into temptation and sin has taken hold of us and the accuser is focusing our attention right there rather than causing us to look up. And so here we are defeated, discouraged, we're looking down, we're ashamed, we didn't lift up our eyes. We're, and remember uh, the, the parable of the, the, the Pharisee and the publican. Remember the publican? He wouldn't so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. And uh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so when sin so dominates our life, even the child of God, it's hard to look up because you're so conscious of your sin. But we need to look up. We need to look once again to the one uplifted on the cross. When he died, all your sins were yet future. And that he take, took care of them all. And not allow the accuser of the brethren to keep our eyes looking at ourselves rather than looking up to the cross and claiming the forgiveness. And we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now one more. I'd like us to look at Ezekiel, please. The prophecy of Ezekiel and chapter 33 and verse 25. He says, Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat with the blood and lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. And shall you possess the land? And so here's another time that we shouldn't be looking up. We shouldn't be looking up and gazing on the idols of our day. And every generation has its idols. Remember the last words of the Apostle John in his first epistle? My little children, keep yourself from idols. And an idol is anything that I look to to satisfy my heart other than the Lord Jesus. That is an idol. And he says, I won't lift up my eyes to that. Don't lift your eyes up to look at idolatry. So having had that little digression, chapter two, verse one, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked. And behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand, <coughs> excuse me, Allergy season here. <coughs> so he sees this man with the measuring line in his hand. And so the question is, who is this man with the measuring line? I want to suggest to you that it's none other than the one who we saw in chapter 1, verse 11, the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. And the reason that I'm suggesting that is that... Um, if it is a picture of the eternal Son of God, which I believe it is, he is always the one who's the builder. Don't we believe that? He's going to build Jerusalem. And what is he going to do now, the Son of God? Remember Matthew 16? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so it would seem to me that consistently this is who's in view. We see him again in chapter 3, verse 1. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And so we're going to see this angel of the Lord again, this Christophany, this, this picture of the pre-incarnate Christ. And he is the one who is the builder. In fact, he is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 16, the message of the angel of the Lord. This is what he says. Therefore saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. And so here he is, stretching forth the line upon Jerusalem to measure Jerusalem, to see what its breadth thereof, what its length thereof. And, and whenever you see this picture, 
it's always a picture of somebody who is about to construct or build and a property is claimed for someone. So let's look at an example of it. Let's go back again to Ezekiel and chapter 40, where we encounter the millennial temple. In Ezekiel 40, as we're going to get the dimensions for building it, before that happens, in Ezekiel um, 40 and verse 5, Behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand, a measuring reed of six cubits long by the cubit and a handbreadth. So he measured the breadth of the building, one reed and the height, one reed. And so we get this idea again that building is about to be constructed. The millennial temple is going to be built because the one with a measuring reed or the measuring line is ready to begin construction. Even in Revelation chapter 11, concerning the tribulation temple, which I believe to be completely different to the millennial temple. It says, there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and they that worship therein. So it's always to do with something that's going to be constructed. God's intention is to do it. And again, he's the builder. He's going to build his church as well. The gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. And so measuring, measuring out, getting ready to build. And so he says uh, that back in our passage, then said I, whither goest thou? He said, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, what the length thereof. Behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said to him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. So here we've got this, this great promise that God is going to build Jerusalem. And we said there's a near fulfillment of it. It's gonna, it's gonna, the temple is going to be constructed now. That's the purpose of this prophecy of Zechariah. But there's a future fulfillment of it as well. And in the future fulfillment of it, um, we're going to see that it, the city will be built completely without walls. There'll be no need for Nehemiah to build any walls because we've already said, verse 5, the Lord will be to her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. So every time we have these prophecies, Zechariah is given a near view to encourage the building now and a long view to show what God's ultimate purpose is for the land and for the nation. Now, as we think of this ultimate uh, view, notice it says not only is the Lord going to be a wall of fire round about her, but he's also going to be the glory in the midst of her. And this is why we, we say that this has to have a long-term view. Because when this temple is rebuilt, and we've already mentioned this, when the tabernacle was built, the glory of the Lord filled the house. They couldn't even enter in, right? Because of the glory that filled the house. When Solomon's temple was dedicated, the glory of the Lord filled the house. When the temple of Solomon was destroyed, the glory of the Lord left. Ichabod, right? The glory has departed. I want to just uh, show you that. Let's look back to Ezekiel. Funny how we're uh, spending time in Ezekiel tonight, but that's okay. Ezekiel chapter 9. I want you just to see verse 3. The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And so you see that the glory of the Lord, it, it's, it's over the cherubim, right? In the, in the Solomon's temple, but it's, it's leaving there and it's going to the threshold of the house. Now that's not the end of its journey. 
Let's look at chapter 10, verse 19. Ezekiel 10, verse 19. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So the glory leaves above the Ark of the Covenant from between the cherubim. It goes to the east gate of the city. Chapter 11, verse 23. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. That's the Mount of Olives. And literally the glory of, of God leaves. The temple of Solomon, once the place where God's glory had filled the place, was now Ichabod. The word glory is kabod. So when you see Ichabod, it means the glory has departed. And the glory, literally, Ezekiel was taken to Jerusalem to witness the glory departing. And then, of course, Nebuchadnezzar would come and would destroy it. Now let's go back to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43, remember in chapter 40, the line is stretched out to measure the temple. And when we get to Ezekiel 43, let's begin reading in verse 1. Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looks towards the east. Remember, it went out the glory through the east gate. And now he's told, look to the east gate. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And I want to just fill in the details. See, when the Lord Jesus comes, <laughs> he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, the very place where the glory left, and going to come in through the east gate. It says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like a noise of many waters. The earth shined with his glory was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kiba, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. I heard him speaking to me out of the house, and the man stood by me, and so on and so forth. So we get the glory of the God of Israel coming back in the millennium to the reconstructed temple to dwell once again in the midst of his people. It's always a, a, a solemn thing when God's glory departs from his people when they lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines, the glories departed. And I think about the church of Laodicea. See, we often claim the Lord is in our midst, don't we? Two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. But where was the Lord of glory in the assembly of Laodicea. Where is he? He's outside and he's knocking on the door and saying, let me in. Could it be that the Laodicean church is the Ichabod church? Still carrying on business as usual, still having their meetings, maybe even still saying where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst but he's outside the door. And we have to be very honest that God is serious about his glory. And if we are like the Laodicean church, how could we dare claim his presence in the midst? And there's a blindness about the Laodicean church. They don't see it, but the Lord is outside. He's looking for individuals that will take him seriously. 
and we're enough of that let's go back to our passage and again just to in in conclusion of this session because our time has flown by this evening the promise is in a coming day in the near future he's going to rebuild the temple he's going to encourage the rebuilding of the temple but in the future day there won't be a need for nehemiah's walls the city will be rebuilt and it will be repopulated. It will be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. It's gonna be prosperous, bursting metropolis, the capital city of the world. And the Lord is going to be her defender. He will be a wall of fire round about her and he will be the glory in the midst of her. What a beautiful prospect. And all the way through, we're going to see this. Zechariah is given enough encouragement for the present, but he's also given a view of the glory of the future. And in a sense, that's like us. We need encouragement to keep going in the present, but we can't take our eyes off the glorious future for a second, right? We need both. Both factors have to be in our view. Well, Lord willing, Next time, we will pick up in chapter 2, verse 6, to the end of the chapter and consider the people. The city is going to be built. The measuring line is out that he's going to build. And, by the way, he wants us to be involved in building, to be co-laborers together with him. Paul could say, I'm a wise master builder, right? It was, I'm building with him. And he wants us to be building with him on the one thing that will outlast the edifices of this world. Once Wall Street is collapsed, once the cities of the nation have fallen, the church of the Lord Jesus will eternally be the object of the affections of the Lord. And so to be involved in building that, you cannot be involved in anything more precious, more lasting, more worthy of your involvement and that's in being involved in the church of the lord jesus that eternal edifice that will forever be the object of his affections may the lord encourage us with these thoughts amen